Before we launch into what is commonly referred to as the message, I want to affirm those who have in the past and will continue to lead our time together around the Lord's table. Those that lead us, lead us with humility, sensitivity and invest time to draw out meaning both personally and also revelation of what God has been saying to them. For me, I personally uh, and deeply appreciate the significant contribution uh, that you bring to our worship times. This is all part of a caveat or uh, a disclaimer to say that nothing about what I'm about to say is directed to any one person, nor should my reflections be viewed as a criticism of anyone who ever leads communion here. However, if you feel as though I overstep things in what I say, please lovingly point them out to me rather than run to others. Also, please don't assume that I'm going to want to radically introduce changes um, and, and suddenly things go all different to what they've been in the past. As I did last week, I also want to take some time to pause towards the end of our time together to hear your thoughts, to answer your questions and respond to your comments that you might have today. Communion or the Lord's Supper, uh, and I'll use both terms interchangeably and intentionally, have its roots even going further back than the Passover meal. You know, covenant agreements in many cultures were, were sealed with the sacrifice of animals. The Bible reading that, um, that Roz read for us today was from Genesis chapter 15, verse 7 to 18. And it was a familiar custom to have an animal cut in half and then both parties would be invited to walk between those animals, between that sacrifice. The concept was that if I break, say, your both halves of the animal and we walk in amongst the halves, then basically what we're saying is if I break my covenant with the person that I walk down that row with, if I break my covenant with you, then may what has happened to these animals also happen to me. That was the symbolic nature of what they were doing. It's interesting to see in Genesis 15, Yahweh God in the form of a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch. Yahweh God is the only one to move between the sacrificed animals. God is in fact saying to Abraham in this example, I am making this covenant with you. I bind myself to it. In the Lord's Supper, Jesus makes a covenant with us. His life is the sacrifice in our place for our breaking of our relationship, our covenant with God. In communion, Jesus is the agent of our salvation. He both makes the covenant and places himself as the perfect sacrifice and seals the covenant with his blood. We are the receiver, the recipient of the blessings and the benefits of the covenant. Our role is to receive. Jesus binds himself to the covenant that he has made with us. Before the days of Abram, throughout the Old Testament and in the New Testament, hospitality was of the utmost importance. Before there was best Western hotels and drive throughs when people travelled, they relied on the hospitality of others, not only for their comfort, but also for their very survival. The practice of hospitality was a matter of family pride and it was shameful not to offer hospitality to someone, whether it be a meal or a bed for the night. And then looking through the corridor of time, the writer of Hebrews reflects in Hebrews 13, verse 1 and 2. Keep on loving each other as brothers and sisters. Don't forget to show hospitality to strangers. For some who have done this have entertained angels without realising it. This is likely a reference to Genesis chapter 18 and 19. Communing with someone was about connecting with them getting to know their story and perhaps them getting to know yours a little bit as well. When we share around the Lord's table, we we often will get to know the person that shares around the Lord's table, leads us through that time a little bit more, which is great. 
But the primary focus is about getting to know God better. Our purpose is to be reminded and hopefully get to know Jesus more as we commune around his table. Have you ever noticed how limbs severed from a body don't survive too long? For our creator God, the only criticism that he brought when he looked at his perfect creation was that it, a lone person is not good. Companionship, communion, hospitality and deeper friendship should be the best experience and should be best expressed through a faith community such as Northern. And I know my busyness in life is a barrier for better community. I'm guilty of this. I need to build some changes into my life to lead a better example, catching up with people over a cuppa or a meal and sharing life and hospitality together. But it's also important to remember that neither communion nor morning tea is a replacement for deeper hospitality where we connect with others outside of the convenient relationship that we base ourselves in Sunday services. Communion is also a foretaste of hospitality to come when Jesus promises us in John 14, 1 to 3, don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God and also trust in me. There is more than enough room in my Father's home. If this were not so, would I have told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you? When everything is ready, I will come and get you so that you will always be with me where I am. So when we gather around the Lord's table, we experience a foretaste of the hospitality of Jesus and we extend this hospitality to travellers in our midst. Whether they join us for a Sunday, for several months, or years to come as they settle with us as a faith community. Jesus himself said in Matthew 26, verse 29, uh, Mark my words, I will not drink wine again until the day I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. And in Revelation 19, it echoes stories of the, uh, that Jesus told about um, preparing a place and a, a wonderful feast and Old Testament prophets also echo this as well, reminding us that this will not be just a small glass of juice, but one amazing celebratory feast. We shouldn't be surprised um, at this because breaking bread was so much more than just fulfilling the necessity of nourishment. Breaking bread together meant so much more than that. Sharing a meal with another person was to identify, was to associate with them. And while the religious elite at times in the New Testament would corrupt this by inviting someone to a meal to exert their superiority or to make sport of them, Jesus never meant this. The story of Matthew, the tax collector, is a wonderful example of the significance of associating and identifying with someone over a meal. We can pick up the account in Mark chapter 2, verses 15 to 17. Later, Levi, who was to become known as Matthew, invited Jesus and his disciples to his home as dinner guests, along with many tax collectors and other disreputable sinners. There were many people of this kind among Jesus followers. When the teachers of the religious law, who were the Pharisees, saw him eating with tax collectors and sinners, they asked his disciples, why does he eat with such scum? When Jesus heard this, he told them, healthy people don't need a doctor, sick people do. I have come to call not those who think they are righteous, but those who know they are sinners. The person who hosts a dinner party, invites the guests. But Jesus was also willing and actually defended not only um, the acceptance of the invitation, but also those he was associating with, protecting them. Such scum of the earth. When it comes to the Lord's table, it's Jesus who extends the invitation and we continue to do that through those who lead at times 
around it. For some reason, the churches of Christ in the past has felt it was their responsibility to pick and choose who could come, undermining what Alexander Campbell reacted against. You see, in the 1700s and the 1800s, his local Presbyterian church in Scotland would have the elders go and visit the parishioners, the people in the congregation. And they would check to see whether you measured up or not. And if you did, they would give you a lead token. You would bring that lead token to the service on Sunday and you would exchange it, you would drop it in and they would then serve you communion. But only if you had been given that lead token. If you measured up. Campbell concluded and he reacted against this saying, it was the Lord's table. He welcomes Christians no matter what Christian brand name they wear. The churches of Christ have and continue to be identified as people of the open table. Hand aside, in looking at the giving back of control of the Lord's table to Jesus, reflects, so when, did, when precisely did we become people of the open table? Certainly by the 1960s and 70s, Churches of Christ in Australia welcomed other denominations to share with us at the Lord's table. And by then, women were presiding in many churches too. But we didn't invite our children until a decade or more later, arguing that giving them communion before baptism would undermine the impetus to be baptised. For people with mental impairments, those who could never make an adult decision to be baptised, their story has been different again and sometimes a source of great regret. It is impossible to say precisely when open table became practice um, uh, amongst Australian church, churches of Christ because it grew congregation by congregation unfurling across the movement. our movement. Communion continues to have a strong and significant link back to the Passover, as we regularly hear referred to and as described in Exodus 12. Once again, a perfect lamb was selected and sacrificed. Its blood was shed across and spread across and painted across the door frames of the home. God's judgment passed over the house and all who were within were protected and spared punishment. There were so many symbolic elements within the meal, lamb, bitter herbs, unleavened bread, wine, each one reflecting different aspects of the Passover tradition. But within the meal, on what is probably the third year that Jesus ate it with his disciples, Jesus reframed two common elements. Not the lamb, not the bitter herbs, but the bread and the wine over the years in churches of Christ, a legalistic approach to the elements and the way it has been distributed has been gradually relaxed. During the 1860s and 70s, when our temperance campaigners worked to have alcohol banned, we stopped using alcohol for communion wine and adapted and adopted grape juice instead or other substitutes. The connection was made between sanitation and the spread of disease in the late 1800s or so as diphtheria and other contagious illnesses came to our to a district our churches packed up their chalice and bought individual glasses sterling is interesting to read some of his writings and reflections on it he, and he notes that one of the last new zealand churches to adopt individual cups did so within a week of a member who normally sat near the front was diagnosed with cancer of the lip. While in Western Australian church, uh, change when a boy with a mental disability began draining the whole cup, necessitating a refilling during the service. Even the last tacit communion creed is being relaxed, that of weekly communion. Across our churches of Christ, an increasing number of churches are relaxing the frequency of celebrating communion from weekly to monthly. Those who claim weekly celebration was what Jesus taught lack scriptural support for this. I was surprised myself when I was reading through the, um, 
and uh, preparing for this message, that in all four Gospels which refer to Jesus celebrating the Passover, only three give reference to the reframing of the bread and the cup as symbols of Jesus' body. And of these three, only one, Luke's account, in Luke chapter 22, verse 19, gives Jesus' direction to do this to remember me. And while we might rightly claim that the New Testament church developed a a tradition or a custom of celebrating the Lord's Supper on the first day of the week, based on Acts chapter 20, verse 7, Sterling notes that this would have been on Saturday night at a Saturday night meal for the first day of the week began on Saturday night. As we reflect on Acts chapter 2, verses 42 and 47, all the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper and to prayer. A deep sense of awe came over them all and the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders and all the believers met together in one place and they shared everything they had. They sold their properties and their property and possessions and shared the money with those in need. They worshipped together at the temple each day, met in homes for the Lord's Supper and shared their meals with great joy and generosity, all the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all the people. And each day the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. I hope that as a faith community we would be deeply devoted to spending time in God's Word and the teaching of Scripture, that we would be deeply devoted to fellowship, that we would be deeply devoted to the sharing of meals together and to the Lord's Supper. We would be deeply devoted to prayer. We do well not to pick and choose our favourites and ignore or lack devotion to another. As I mentioned earlier, I'm going to pause for a few minutes and allow for a bit of Q&A, a little bit of response The whole idea with Q&A is you do Q, I do A, you ask the questions. Hopefully, I might be able to answer anything that's too tough for me. I'll hand over to Matt and he can answer for me. Um, But I'll grab the microphone and after that, I'll wrap up with some final thoughts. But if you've got any questions or comments or reflections, love to hear those from you now. And I'll wander around with the microphone. It's always tough being the first one to start, isn't it? Joe, and then I'll go over to In the book of Corinthians, <coughs> pardon me, uh, Paul talks about preparing yourself for the Lord's Supper mm. and uh, the worthiness uh, of that preparation. Yep. Yeah, he does. And, and that's a really important point, that it's not something to be taken lightly. It's not something to be blasé about. But it's also not something to be freaked out by. I remember reading a story about one guy who, you know, or actually it wasn't a story, it was a a friend of mine at the time that that for her, whenever there was communion, because it was in a church where it was the first and third Sunday of the month, the first Sunday morning and the third Sunday night of the month, and she would almost become paralysed with fear when it came to communion. Because what if she drank it in an unworthy manner? And so for us, we need to recognise that there is forgiveness, but there is also opportunity. And the biggest thing that Paul was critical of in 1 Corinthians 11 was the relationship towards one another, that the way the the church in Corinth was behaving towards one another was almost like pushing each other out of the road. I want to get first. Because it was like, the smorgasbord meal that Pat was talking about today. And there was this food and people, uh, one of the reasons why the love feast, which often was associated with communion, was dropped in um, the years after that, was because of the abuses around it. Because they treated it not just like a smorgasbord, but like a free-for-all. And people were gorging themselves, getting drunk, and that sort of stuff. And it wrecked the whole thing. And so the whole examining yourself was to examine your priorities, examine your relationship with others, examine your relationship with Jesus, 
Make sure you're doing things to get things right, whether that be with your relationship with Jesus or with others as well. Okay. Yep. Um, as far as having communion. Yep. So because we're living, um, you know, in the last days, as it sometimes is referred to, um, we're living between Jesus' resurrection and him coming again. Um, shouldn't that be all the more important that we, we live according to what we discover in Acts? Absolutely. We should be looking out for others. We should be devoting ourselves to reading the scripture. We should be um, devoting ourselves to prayer. And so often, just the, the, the stuff of life gets in the road of those priorities. And that's a challenge for each one of us. Any other questions or comments? Yeah. I always thought that the major difference between the Baptist Church and the Churches of Christ was that the Baptist Church had communion once a month and we had it every time we met. (coughs) Pardon me. And I asked them why they had it once a month and they said it was because they wanted it to mean more. Mm -hmm. Question to you is, um, and now you're saying that it's nothing... Please explain. Please explain. Okay. I, I, I... Whilst I do come from Baptist heritage, um, I can't speak on behalf of every Baptist, but there is a danger around familiarity breeding contempt. So the more familiar we become with something, and there have been um, there has been a church, a Christ church that I attended, where they had communion at the back of the auditorium, and at a part of the service they said, okay, anyone that wants to have communion, We'd now have a time you can go up the back and you can have it and, and that sort of stuff. And then they got on with the last parts of the service. And so it was kind of like this, this um, sort of like a token gesture. We've got to fit this in because that's the thing that we do, but it interrupts everything else that we do. And so you know, let's just push it to the back or let's push it to the sides or whatever else it might be. And, and so there is a danger about that. And that's one of the great things about not just having Matt or I being the people that lead communion, that we do share it. And that's one of the things that's been an important trait for Churches of Christ is that by having multiple voices, a variety of people bringing reflection, it does help to keep it fresh. It does help to keep it vibrant. Yes, we are always in danger that when we do something on a regular basis, we can be dismissive of it. And that's something that we always need to be careful of as well. Yep. Yeah, go for it. Just just one other thing that came to my mind with Tracy's question is um, as well as it, um, regularity can breed contempt, like David said, it can also sometimes we can get this mindset that unless I have communion each week that I'm not right with God. Mm. And and I, good I, I think that, that so that's where you're taking it. To a level where it's it's sort of almost like it's almost like an idol, mm. um, which sounds strange because it's such a beautiful thing that we do. But um, but if you if you come to church and you don't get communion for whatever reason, and you feel like you're walking away and you don't feel right with God, then then that's a wrong understanding of of communion. Um, so there is freedom um, for the Baptist to choose once a month. They're honouring they're honouring Christ through through that, whereas um, we we we've said we want to honour Christ by doing it every week, and there's nothing that's there's nothing wrong with either either way, um, in my opinion. Yeah, and, and they're not better Christians or more saved than us or vice versa. Uh, just a comment on that, Matt. It's not a question of every week. It's whenever Christians meet together, mm-hmm. they can share with the Lord's Supper. Yep. And that is often, that is the practice, that is practice with Churches of Christ. Mm. Thank you. Um, it has been a practice of Churches of Christ. We don't practice it quite as much in that way because we meet together in homes and we don't necessarily celebrate communion in homes. And that was certainly an example in Acts uh, where whenever people got together in a home, they would have communion. And an increasing number of Churches of Christ are no longer having it every week. They're doing it once a month, those sorts of things. Now, that doesn't mean that they're betraying or um, turning away from their roots. They're just doing it a little bit differently. And I think there is scope in the scripture for that as well. 
but in some areas, people are having communion in a, a, over a number of times. Absolutely. So they're the home church people yep. that meet, uh, do have communion, and also the people that meet on a Sunday in corporate worship, a congregational worship, they also have it. So you could end up with two or three times that you're commemorating what Christ has done for us. Mm. And if you leave it for one month, and I have attended churches, uh, uh, St Michael's in the city for a number of months, and they had it once a month uh, at the end of the service, and I enjoyed that. But I believe that the practice has, as uh, Ron said, as oft as you meet, do this and we re remember what Jesus did for us and we could commune with him prayerfully while we take part in it. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you. Yep. Thanks, Paul. Yeah, my wife and I, whenever we, we can't uh, go to church on Sunday, it is our practice to have communion, mm. just the two of us. Yeah. Because the Bible says, uh, for one or two, God is together in my name. Yeah. There you are. Yeah. And every time that you remember me, do it. And you can do it every day also if you want to. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. And I think there is, we need to recognize that there is both freedom in this and that there is opportunity for us to continue to be creative in the way that we engage in communion. That we are not any less following of Jesus that we are not doing anything wrong if for some reason we believe that communion in this way is not appropriate on this particular occasion. So um, at um, you know, funerals and weddings, do we necessarily celebrate communion? Um, there's a number of other times when we gather together as Christians that we may not have communion. Does that make it wrong? Does that make that, that God is not honoured? I, I don't think so. And I don't read that in what the Bible teaches. But we are encouraged to do it regularly, to remember Jesus in it. And if it becomes something that we become either legalistic about, then we're returning back to something that I don't believe the churches of Christ actually stood for. Because they were anti-legalism. They were anti-rules. And they were anti-using the Bible as a book of rules to beat people up over. Yep. Yep. No creed but Christ, no book but the Bible. Yeah, that's right. But it's also about how we handle the book of the Bible and that for Campbell, for Stone, for others since then, it's about not using the Bible to beat people up with, but it's about expressions of grace. So what's central? So where do we go with this? When we think about it and we think about communion... What do, we, what do we take away from this? Well, Sterling writes, for most of our people, celebrating the Lord's Supper has been a vital support to their faith and spirituality. However, it has not been free from some legalism that arises whenever the New Testament is regarded as a book of rules rather than the story of how early Christians expressed their faith and life in the first century uh, first century situation and culture. For instance, we took Jesus' invitation to remember his death in bread and wine as a command to be obeyed, forgetting that our Lord was not... Um, sorry, our Lord was not the sort of person to demand that he should be remembered by his friends. In my reading of the missional movement of the churches of Christ, and over the years that we have journeyed together, we have sought common ground. And at times we've seen past errors in what we've sought to control or close off the Lord's Supper to only a few that we thought were fit. We've reacted uh, and retracted at to, from our legalism over the elements that we have used and how we have served it. Sterling encouraged creativity around communion. There is always room for effective innovation in our observance. Each time we continue to maintain the significance of who is the focus, that is Jesus, and what is of significance, remembering Jesus and his saving grace, past, present and future. And even now among our churches, 
there are times that we step back from the legalism that is like is like is about its location in the service and whether it is required to be a weekly observant. So what is central? When we think about the churches of Christ and when we think about the common ground on which we stand, what is central to that? As we continue to seek, to journey, to be a missional movement. Well, first and foremost, it always remains that the focus is on Jesus. We come to celebrate the Lord's Supper. We celebrate an open table an invitational table where children and adults and such scum are welcome because Jesus welcomed all of these in his life. We are welcome not because of what we have done or because of a box that we have tipped, but because of Jesus' covenant sacrifice, because of Jesus' hospitality, which is fully realised in the future because of Jesus' desire to commune with us and his invitation for us to commune with him, because Jesus models to us hospitality and desires us to follow his example and to show hospitality to others beyond the Sunday cuppa, to commune with others through whom we get to experience the love of Jesus and they hopefully through us as well. Some may still celebrate with unleavened bread and wine, others with rice and sake. Some will celebrate weekly, monthly or even yearly. We, out of a desire to ensure unity and welcomeness, celebrate with rice crackers and apple and guava juice and we will continue to celebrate regularly with creativity and innovation. But who we come to must always be the focus. We come to the Lord's table, the Lord's supper, and we seek to deepen our communing with Jesus in community with the body. And we look forward to celebrating it anew with Jesus in his Father's kingdom. So how do we respond today? How do we respond to the things that we've read, the things that we've seen, the things that we've heard? Well, one of the questions is, how have my views on the Lord's Supper changed over time? Was it something that's taken a greater seriousness, a greater significance as we've gotten um, further along in our journey with Jesus? Perhaps thank God for some times when you've experienced hospitality. Ask God to help you express grace to others who hold different views to you on the Lord's Supper. Ask God to help you to be deeply devoted like the first church in Acts, in Acts 2, 42-47. But I believe God invites us to respond. Let's do that now. Some music will be played and then those response cards will be collected with our offering and the pencils during the singing of our final song. God bless you.